That's right. We're going to talk about metabolism. Yes, Olivia. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I do. You need me to. You need me to release it to you, don't I? Okay. Un momento. Let me see what I can do. Escape. Go away. All right, right now, PowerPoint hates me. That's fun. Okay. You guys would like for me... All right. Okay. Got it, Olivia? Can y'all see it now? Okay. So, in some ways, you guys can get off easy things with metabolism. Okay? You, anybody have biochemistry? Okay, you survive. You okay? We need, we need to talk about it. We need to go to the mom and swirl and <laughs> talk about our feelings after, after biochemistry. Okay, so in when Dr. Mike taught this class, metabolism was very simple. Memorize all the steps in glycolysis. Memorize all the steps in the Krebs cycle. Memorize all the cytochromes and the steps in the electron transport chain and then draw them back out on the test and you get a hundred, okay? So you guys don't have to memorize all of those things for me. We're gonna go through and talk about some stuff. We're gonna focus more so on kind of how these pathways regulated and how the pathways all sort of work together, okay? Why some of them are on at certain times compared to the other ones, why this one's going to predominate at this particular time versus another one. And I'll point out to you guys kind of what it is that I want you to know from a step point. Mostly it's going to be what goes into a pathway, what comes out of the pathway, and then is there some key regulatory steps somewhere in that pathway about here's where we determine <clears throat> how and why that pathway is, uh, is, is going to be fast or slow. Okay. When I say the word metabolism, what comes to mind? What do you think of? Heat expenditure. I'm sorry? Heat expenditure. Heat expenditure. Okay. Heat expenditure. Interesting. Anything else? Metabolism. The rate at which, the rate in which I burn calories. I'm being very specific about like real things. Okay. Catabolic and anabolic reactions. Catabolic and anabolic reactions. Okay, good. Somebody said over here said ATP. ATP, Brittany? All of the reactions occur in your body. All of the reactions occur in my body. Chemical. All of them. Chemical. Chemical. Okay. Okay. There are many metabolic reactions. They're probably not all of our reactions, but that's that's good. Okay. What's happening with y'all's metabolism right now? As you sit there. I'm trying to give us energy to stay away from function. Trying to give you energy to stay away from function. How are we doing with that? How are we doing on the staying away from function? Okay. Okay. So I thought some of you guys might say energy, right? Metabolism is energy. So... Let me put, give you guys some context for, for sort of muscle metabolism and how we're going to approach this from an exercise standpoint. You guys have a finite amount of stored ATP in your body. Okay? Finite amount. Kendall, you want to do something? You want to help us out? Sure. Stand up. Okay. Kendall, can you do five jumping jacks for us? Okay. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. Stop. 
Are you tired? You feel like you've depleted your energy? No. Okay, you may sit down. Thank you, Kendra. She did. Like she doesn't feel like it, but in those five jumping jacks, Kendall used up every bit of stored ATP that was in the muscles that were that she was contracting. Okay, do we need to back up now? Where in the contraction are we using the ATP? Cross bridges, cross bridges. breaking the cross bridges, pulling calcium back into the sarcoplasm in particular. Repolarizing the sarcolemma and the T2 duals in your axon. Okay? It's a lot that goes on. You have a tiny, tiny amount of ATP stored in your muscle because your muscles aren't that big. Okay? And yet, she did five seconds, she used all of it, not tired. You know how long do you think you could have done that without getting tired? Did you go another 30 seconds, you think? Probably. Okay. Five minutes. I know. Jumping jacks are not my fat. We'll see. Okay. What's the longest that you've ever run or walked consecutively? Let's see who wins in class. What's the longest you've ever gone? <laughs> Heard it's gone. Three hours. Three hours and 45 minutes. I didn't think it's time, but I've done 22 miles. 22 miles. Walking or running? Walking with a weighted backpack on. Okay. Okay. 22 miles. Probably took, I don't know, six, six and a half hours, something like that. Okay. I've walked a marathon. It was a terrible experience. I don't know. Do not recommend. Okay. You guys talk Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I've been walking around that with chalk on my jacket for like the whole time. Thanks, man. Um, anyway, okay. If you use up all of the ATP within two or three seconds, and yet, could you walk for six hours if I told you you had to? What about 10? Probably, right? Did you walk for 24 straight hours? You could. I have to give you some food, but you could, I think. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make, okay, I think illustrates how metabolic processes actually work in our muscles better than sort of it's just this reaction and it's this pathway on, on the board or in a book that you're going to see. Okay. You store very little ATP, and yet we are able, through multiple biochemical processes, biochemical reactions, we are able to resynthesize huge amounts of ATP, okay? If you imagine, this is a gross oversimplification, okay? Every time I do a jumping jack, that uses up every bit of ATP that I have in those muscles. So to do a second jumping jack, I can use one of these metabolic reactions to take all of that ATP that I've broken down into ADP and turn it back into ATP. And I do another jumping jack and it's all gone again. Now I gotta go again and again and again, okay? And so the beautiful thing about metabolism is that some of our metabolic processes, if you provide them with what we call a substrate, many of you are consuming substrates right now, right in front of you, okay? Carbs, protein, okay? Food is a substrate. Protein, carbohydrates, fat, something like that. If you provide a substrate into the pathway, and the energy demand is low enough, it's moderate enough, you can keep turning over that ATP for long, long, long periods of time, okay? However, in other instances, if the muscle contractions are intense enough or there's enough muscle involved, force is high enough 
So there's more ATP breakdown. There's more cross bridge turns. There's more calcium resequestration through circa. There's more repolarization of the circa level. If it's high enough, your pathways can't keep up. They can't make enough ATP to meet demand. And so then you got to slow down or you got to stop lifting weights or you got to stop doing your jumping jacks, right? Or if you were running, now you can walk, okay? So there's this very delicate balance that we're going to try to illustrate as we walk our way through our metabolic pathways, okay? But that's what's happening. We talk about muscle first, one, because it's the most important thing to me. Um, it's my favorite thing, but also because we need to understand where ATP gets broken down and how that relates to walking, running, the amount of force we're generating to better understand why some metabolic pathways are going to be used preferentially for certain types of activity. Because the ATP demand is high. Okay. You guys with me so far? Okay, we're not bleeding out of our eyeballs or anything else yet. We will get there, I promise. Okay, we'll get there. Okay, so that's where we are with this, okay? So metabolism, at its most basic, from a biochemical standpoint, is deriving energy, or ATP. Really, it's resynthesizing <laughs> ATP from AMP or ADP. Okay, from the breakdown of various substrates. Okay, food is a substrate. I should have put it on here. Anybody, anybody ever walk, watch Parks and Recreation? Okay, Chris Pratt's character, his name is Andy, there's an episode where he learns that like food becomes energy. And he's like running around and he's like jumping. He's like, okay, right? That's what it goes. Nachos. That's what we're talking about. You eat things and we break them down and we get energy. If you don't eat things, that's also okay. Most of us have large, vast amounts of energy stores, especially in the form of subcutaneous adipose tissue that can sustain us for a while. Okay. Why is it important? Well, movement, muscle contractions require energy. Most other bodily functions require energy, okay? Cardiac muscle contraction require energy. Your brain requires energy, okay? So it's really, really important. What is the significance of metabolism to exercise? Well, most of our physiological responses, things that occur because we're kind of downstream of, I did a muscle contraction, changes in ventilation or respiration, Hormone release, cardiovascular changes, increases in heart rate and stroke volume occur as a result of changes in metabolism, okay? You do a muscle contraction that costs us energy. The contraction needs energy to go again, so we increase our metabolic rate. We start deriving energy from various places. That increase in metabolism is then the thing that tends to signal or trigger Changes in the cardiovascular system, changes in the pulmonary system, changes in hormone responses and things like that, okay? So force production drives metabolism, metabolism drives the vast majority of our other responses, okay? Training adaptations are often proportional to energy expenditure, okay? If you want more mitochondria in your muscles, so you have better aerobic metabolism and better endurance, guess what you have to do? Run long. Yes, you got to run long. You got to make the mitochondria in your muscles currently work really hard. And that can be running long, that can be running fast, it usually, should usually be some combination of both. Okay? Changes in the cardiovascular system are going to occur because cardiovascular system changes occur as a response to met metabolic changes they tend to occur because of changes in metabolism. In some sporting events, your exercise performance is limited by the rate at which you can resynthesize ATP. This is especially true during very high intensity exercise, things like sprinting, okay? 
not so much powerlifting, but if you want to do like CrossFit or something where you're doing not so much like how much weight can I lift one time, but I got to do things like over and over again. Okay. That can be limited by that. Also, very long distance exercise can be limited. Okay. The other really big thing, and it's a much more kind of nuanced thing that we'll talk about next week, is sometimes exercise performance is not limited by the fact that you're out of energy, but it's limited by the fact that in order to supply enough, I have to switch the metabolic pathways that I'm using. And some of those pathways do things that circle back and inhibit muscle. They inhibit the metabolic system. They inhibit the cardiovascular system and they cause fatigue. And that means that you can't go with that intensity of ATP turnover for super long periods of time. We'll get into that. It's a pretty nuanced kind of thing. Okay. All right. And then fatigue can be caused by decreased availability of energy or the accumulation of certain metabolic byproducts. It's hard for you to not have enough metabolic substrate. Okay? I would have to starve you for a very, very long time in order to have no metabolic substrate so that you couldn't walk. But if you don't have enough muscle glycogen, you don't have enough carbohydrates in your blood, we can, in some instances, see decreases in longer distance performance. The corollary of this is that Gatorade does nothing for you other than taste good and help rehydrate unless you're going to exercise for more than about 90 minutes, okay? There's no need for Gatorade. You're going to run a 5K, you don't need Gatorade, drink water. It's important to be hydrated, that matters, but the carbs are of no benefit to you other than maybe it makes it taste better, right? Anybody like me, Blue Powerade? Blue Powerade. There's like crack in the blue power area. My favorite thing in the world. We cannot have it in the house. Okay. All right. So what about the electrolytes and Gatorade's power? What about them? Uh, is that, you, that doesn't have any effect on performance either? So the, I think about how to, how to phrase this correctly. So um, it's interesting. So one of the one of the professors that I had was our department chair when I was in Georgia. Um, Powerade is owned by Coke. Coke is based out of Atlanta. They did he did research on heat stress and hydration, and always had funding to test Powerade and various things. They made Powerade with caffeine in it that we tested, or I say we. I was a participant um, that they tested and it worked beautifully. And it never went to market. I don't know why. There was Powerade with, with caffeine. And of course, because it has caffeine, it works. Um, so the short answer is the electrolytes are important sometimes. And they're likely not important during a particular bout of exercise. You are not going to be limited when you go to do something today because of a lack of sodium or potassium or calcium or whatever that's going to be in there. If you dehydrate yourself today, if you sweat a bunch today, right, you will lose electrolytes from all of that. And then it is potentially you will rehydrate, you will recover your electrolyte balance faster during that sort of recovery from large amounts of sweating and things when you rehydrate. If you have something like Gatorade or Powerade or Pedialyte or something that has some electrolytes in it versus water that has nothing. Um, but by that same token, if you're not like, I don't need to do things again tomorrow, if you can wait a week, then you get plenty of sodium and potassium things from food anyway, and it all kind of, it eventually balances out. So the technical answer is yes, sometimes it is better, but mm, it all depends on, like if you're an athlete, it's gotta go, it's out, I'm outside, I'm hot, I'm sweating, I got a multiple day event, or I got to do things multiple times today, right? Then maybe there is some benefit over water. There's definitely benefit of having the fluid that's in there. So it's a very nuanced kind of answer. Um, Gatorade and Powerade. Gatorade's owned by Pepsi, which is owned by Frito Lay. Um, they used to they used to advertise, and you have to have two. They would fight each other in court all the time. I know this because of our our professor. Is his stuff that they they would always want papers from him. They could go to court. You have to have two 
independent scientific papers from different institutions and different labs in order to be able to go to court and say that whatever claim you want to make in your advertisement is supported by science. And they would fight back and forth about those things. So things that I we will talk about fluid replacement and exercise in the heat at the very end of class. So if you guys are interested in that, we'll do some more. Okay. The process that I've already described to you about how to put all the amount of ATP, you break it down, we use a metabolic pathway to resynthesize it, is essentially, okay, the first law of thermodynamics. Okay. Energy is never created or destroyed. We just shift it from one place to another. So you have some, we break it down, and then we shift that energy that's stored in those substrates and shift it over to make ATP back. And then the ATP shifts that energy into, right, the myosin ATPase or onto the calcium ATPase. And then it's now ADP again, and we shift it back then from carbs or from fat, okay? So that's what we're getting. So your energy that you've got in your body, your total energy is potential energy plus kinetic or whatever is being used. So think of this, uh, you have some capacity to make ATP based upon all of the carbs and fat and protein and things that exist in your body, okay? Plus then whatever it is that you're expending just by being awake and sitting here, all right? So that's kind of this general idea, okay? We need to get this. I know it's difficult and it's probably kind of a three-dimensional way of thinking about this that is probably beyond just here is a pathway on a piece of paper and we do this and then we do this and then we do this, okay? All of this in living systems is this kind of interaction that is gonna take place, okay? Okay, don't worry about potential and kinetic energy. I just put it on here so you guys have some background for some terms, if you care, okay? Biologic work in humans. We are going to use ATP during muscle contractions, we're going to use ATP to do what they call chemical work. So breaking down things, glucose to glycogen, okay? Breaking down um, stored lipids is going to cost us things. Breaking down protein, putting proteins together costs us energy. And then there's this transport kind of kinetic stuff where we're going to use ATP in the sodium potassium pump, in the calcium pumps and those things, okay? So... We use energy in a lot of places that we use. At rest, I should have looked this up again. Again, I apologize, guys. Something like 20% of all of your energy expenditure right now is being used by the sodium potassium pump to repolarize all of your membranes and, and things in the nervous system and in the muscle. Okay. So we use a huge amount just to exist and to be alive. Okay. It's not chemistry class. We're not going to go in very deep into ATP other than this is kind of the workable unit of energy that we have. It's an adenosine molecule. It has three, hence the tri, three phosphate groups attached onto it. Okay. That's going to become very, very important as we move along. Okay. The rate of ATP turnover or ATP use in muscle depends on work rate, which depends on force production, okay? We use ATP to break actin and myosin apart. We have to do a very good job of this on the test, okay? The more muscle we engage to get more force, the more cross bridges then have to be broken so we can go over and over again, the more ATP we use. The more total muscle in your body that you use at once, walking, involves more muscle contractions and more work than a single arm bicep curl, okay? Or a single calf raise, okay? Or me wagging my pinky or my finger at you or blinking my eyes or something like that, okay? As I said, total energy stored is ATP within your cells, very, very low. Like one or two contractions worth and it's gone, okay? <clears throat> So what we're going to spend the next few class periods talking about is how do we get more? 
You've done a contraction. You've broken down this ATP. Now you need more so you can keep doing things. Where does it come from? And why does it come from the various places that it's going to? I'm going to say this now, and then we're going to forget about this until we come back at the end, okay? The metabolic pathway that you use, as well as the substrate, whether it's carbs or protein or lipids or fat, that you are using at any given moment in time will be dependent upon, are you exercising or not? What is the mode, okay? Is it running? Is it biking? Is it stair climbing, right? Is it rowing? Something like that. It's very dependent upon it, exercise intensity, so overall force production. The presence or lack of oxygen Oxygen plays less of a role than you guys probably think it is. You guys ever been in a place where you don't have any oxygen? Or less oxygen. Underwater, okay. You're all still here, right? So you've never been without oxygen for that long. When you go run and you sprint for a while, you're not stopping because of a lack of oxygen. You're breathing. Maybe it would catch up. It's not because you don't have enough options. There'll be some instances where we will get to there, but it's less of all of that. It's very dependent upon your diet. What have you been eating or not eating? If I feed you a bunch of carbohydrate, guess what you're going to use for energy? Carbs. If I feed you a bunch of fat, guess what you're going to use for energy? Fat. Okay? And your state of training. Those of you that are more aerobically trained, that others will use different pathways and you will mostly metabolize fat to a greater extent. You're better able to metabolize fat than people that are untrained. We'll, we'll kind of get into and talk about the hows and the whys of that as we go along, okay? So I've, I've mentioned this several times, we'll, we'll, we'll hit it again. I know you guys have all had nutrition. Anybody have sport and exercise nutrition with Sarah, okay? Sarah is a saint because she's married to one of my former students. His name is Dar. Um, Dar's a piece of work. I like Dar. He's very bright, but he's a lot. Um, she's a saint. Uh, when I talk about carbohydrates, we're going to use glucose as our kind of reference molecule. It could be sucrose. It could be fructose. It could be galactose. It could be maltodextrin. It's just a carbon molecule. Okay. We store carbohydrates in your body as glycogen. You have some glycogen in your muscles. You have some glycogen in your liver. We'll talk about how we break that glycogen down and when and why that happens so that you can make sure you've got adequate amounts of glucose. I will say this. Your muscles don't have to have glucose. Your brain does. Okay? Your brain does. So we'll, we will talk a little bit, um, not in metabolism, but when we get into kind of performance stuff and talk about fatigue, there are some instances where if you use up your muscle glycogen or your blood glucose falls too much, the brain will not let you, you will feel crappy and the brain will be like, shut it down, okay? Shut it down, we gotta stop this. When I talk about fat or lipids, what I'm really meaning is our storage site is gonna be adipose tissue, so you've got subcutaneous adipose tissue. You have some adipose tissue in your muscle, okay? Um, in and around the individual muscle fibers. People that are highly aerobically trained have more than people that are less trained than people that are obese have even more still. Kind of a weird phenomenon. You have fat in and around your liver. It's not great. That's predictive of diabetes. Um, and then we're gonna talk about that it's stored in one way but then we're going to look at these molecules that we call free fatty acids, okay? Free fatty acids that are going to, that are going to get released into the bloodstream. And we break it down. In comparison to carbohydrate, you have like 80 times more stored lipid in your body than you do carbohydrate, okay? This is huge amounts, okay? Some of us more than others. Um, and then there's protein. We don't like to use protein as a metabolic substrate. The body would prefer not to, but it can, okay? 
if you are in a negative caloric balance for any period of time, one of the body's things that it will do is it will start breaking down muscle to release amino acids. So those amino acids can get converted into glucose through a process called gluconeogenesis in the liver, okay? That's why if you take people that don't eat any carbs and you test them, they still have what? They still have carbs. But a lot of it is gonna come from this gluconeogenesis process that's going to be there, okay? So we don't wanna use protein unless we absolutely have to, okay? And that creates a little bit of issue for people wanting to lose weight, but also maintain muscle mass. Um, and so we will we will get into that when we get into the protein reactions a little bit later on, okay? All right. Ah, the glyco words, okay? I forget what these are. They're not exactly, is it homonym, I don't know, something. Whatever the, the actual like English, the words you describe, words that look the same or like there's they sound the same, but they're spelled different and all of those those kinds of things. Homophones. Pardon? Homophones. Homophones, homonyms, I don't know, something, something like all this. What do I always think about this? Okay. Things that have to do with glycogen and glucose. So carbohydrate, there are these processes, and they all kind of sound the same, but they're very distinct. And I just need you guys to know and memorize them, okay? So the metabolic pathway that we're going to learn about next week called glycolysis, okay? That involves the breakdown of glucose to ATP and lactic acid sometimes, okay? Sometimes, not always to lactic acid. Sometimes. That's glycolysis, breaking down glucose. Glycogenesis, okay? Genesis meaning origin, starting, put together, is where we make glycogen from multiple molecules of glucose, okay? Glycogenolysis is the breakdown. It's the reverse of glycogenesis. It's the breakdown of glycogen to glucose. That particular process is driven by an enzyme called phosphorylase. We'll cover this a little bit later on, but you guys are going to have to know this enzyme. You're going to have to know phosphorylase. Okay? There's some things that happen during exercise that activate phosphorylase that tell your muscles and your liver to break down glycogen. And then there is the, the kind of fun one that I, I like called gluconeogenesis. And this is making glucose from a non-carbohydrate precursor, mostly amino acids that have come from protein. This process takes place in the liver, okay? And when you eat a lot of protein, you got a lot of amino acids, you'll do this. When you're in a negative caloric balance, and you begin to break down skeletal muscle, you'll do this as well. Okay. Those are kind of our, those are sort of our things. Uh, here's just fun with math. Stored carbohydrate in an average person, about 1,500 calories. So you've got about a day's worth of stored carbs. Uh, in a reasonably, like, sort of lean person, subcutaneous fat, like 72,000. Okay. That's just in the fat. Um, or about 71,000 in sub-Q, okay? So huge, huge, huge amounts. Because of this, you can go weeks without eating if you get water and still live. You will not be happy, right? But you can still live. We'll call that the survivor diet um, on those kinds of things. Okay, we don't need to worry about that. So I'm going to mention one thing here. We're not going to actually even get into any of the pathways. This is a reasonable place. It's a reasonable place to stop. stop. Okay. What I'm about to tell you I have found is something that is very difficult for students to grasp. It's hard for me who's been doing this for 20 years to grasp. Okay. 
As you sit there right now, you're not even exercising. As you sit there right now, every metabolic pathway in your body is making ATP simultaneously. Every one of them is active right now. Every substrate in your body is being used to make ATP right now. All the pathways are on all the time, and you're always using some carbs, and some lipid, and probably some protein, especially if you eat some protein, a little bit of that, okay? And this is what makes this difficult, at least to me. This is what makes this conceptually difficult. What is happening right now, as you sit there and you are at rest, ATP demand is relatively low in comparison to exercising or something like that, okay? So the pathway that gives you the most ATP right now may be different than what happens if I ask you to get up and start doing squats or start going to the sprint. The substrates you're using the most right now may be different than what's going to happen to the exercise. It may be. It's not all of it. And then even crazier, if I have you, if we had had Kendall keep doing her jumping jacks, and she did jumping jacks for the whole class period, she would have shifted her pathways and substrates going from rest to exercise. And then over the course of our class time, the 45 minutes I've been talking, we would have likely shifted the pathways and the substrates that she was using again. Even though on the surface, it's the same jumping jack, she's still doing them, still at the same rate. Everything looks the same from an output standpoint, but where the ATP comes from will likely be a little bit different. And that's what we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about is why is it something now while you sit there? And what is it that it's gonna to change to? And what are the signals that drive that when we go to action? Okay. All right, guys. Have a good weekend. If you do not want to do correction, bring me your test. Okay?